Hi, welcome to Blogging Heads TV. This is Culturally Determined, and I'm your host, Arya Cohen-Wade. And my guest today is Jeet here. Uh, Jeet, could you introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm a Canadian uh, journalist and uh, academic. I write on a bunch of uh, different things related to politics and culture. And I guess most uh, relevantly for today's show, uh, I have a, a collection of essays called Sweet Lettery, which uh, we'll be talking about. Right. So I'm holding up to the screen your uh, Sweet Lettery right now. Uh, it's a really, uh, really enjoyable book. It's um, it's a really great, like, physical object. Um, you know, I don't know if there's, like, a digital, like, Amazon Kindle version or something, but, like, you know, if someone was considering whether to get the physical object or the digital version, I would definitely recommend getting the physical object because it's really beautifully designed and you have these... Yeah, it, it can be purchased digitally, but uh, the reason I went with the publisher, Porcupine's Quill, was um, uh, they're known for doing like really beautiful books. Mm -hmm. uh, they publish uh, the books in house. They have it's uh, the publishing company has a small uh, office in Erin Mills, Ontario, and they they make the books there. So my publisher actually like physically made <laughs> every one of these books. Oh, so it's it's, uh, it's, it's and, vertically integrated. It's vertically integrated. That's right. And uh, and I also I uh, was lucky enough to get a friend of mine, the cartoonist Sap. Uh, who people might know from the New Yorker uh, and other places, and as a great graphic novelist, uh, he did the uh, both the cover, but he also did the book design. He did like he created the font that's used throughout the book, and he created all these little uh, bells and whistles. There's like these dingbats that he's placed all throughout the book. Yeah, these so, little uh, they're, they're, little owl icons and just other kind of yeah, yeah. Stuff. There's all the little icons and and uh, and then, then there's also an essay. The last essay of the book is about Seth and book design. So I feel that, again, that's, uh, that is vertically integrated, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And so I guess, well, actually, the first question would be, uh, could you talk a little bit about the, the title and where it comes from? There's actually a quote on the, on the front cover revealing the um, author of this, quote, sweet lettery. So could you talk a little, about, a little bit about why you chose that title? Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, the title comes from Guy Davenport, who's a, an American short story writer, translator, and a literary critic, and, and many other things. He's a real Renaissance man. Uh, and uh, he has, in his very first short story collection, Catlin, in the very first story, he uh, refers to the sweet lechery of the inquiring mind. Uh, and I, thought, I always thought that was a beautiful phrase. Uh, and, uh, and I wanted to, I mean, it would be presumptuous of me to uh, uh, compare myself to Davenport because he's just like a much more learned man than I am. Mm -hmm. But I, I do admire him as a model, as, as someone, uh, you know, who tried to uh, bring to his writing that spirit of inquiry. And also, I, I think the phrase captures maybe like a spirit of, of fun and of, of trying to do intellectual work for pleasure. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so, so I, which was all kind of... Um, uh, uh, behind a lot of these essays. Like, I, I try to write about, you know, very serious things, uh, you know, like politics and war, uh, but, all, but also maybe to bring to it, you know, like sort of like a, a freshness of perspective and a certain playfulness that I think is really essential for the, for the essay form. Yeah, I think, I think you know, playfulness is, is a really great term to describe kind of the, the tone of a lot of this, even when you're talking about something, something serious. Um, and, and I, I must admit that I never heard of Guy Davenport before, um, reading this. So I'm interested to, to you know, to, uh, you have, uh, I think two essays in here about, about him. So it was interesting to learn more about him and I'm, I want to read some of his stuff now. Um, so I guess the first. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Guy, Guy Davenport is sort of, you know, he's like more obscure than he should be. And he is a really sort of towering figure, uh, for, for me and for, you know, the few other people that know his work, mm -hmm. um, uh, for, for your listeners and then maybe for you yourself, I think the place to start is a book he did called The Geography of the Imagination, mm -hmm. which is a collection of his essays. And it's really, uh, you know, dealing with a lot of it with the great modernists, with like Ezra Pound, Wallace Stevens, Marianne Moore, and then but also like more um, uh, uh, unexpected things. He has an essay in there about Tarzan. Uh, he had studied under J.R.R. Tolkien. He uh, unsuccessfully tried to learn Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> he has an essay about that, and he has an essay uh, about uh, 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 his uh, dietary habits, which heavily relied on Snicker bars. So, <laughs> so, 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 so it's a kind of it's a it's a. Uh, I, I think it's one of the great American essay collections, and uh, again, it, it, it's presumptuous to 
even uh, put myself in that same category. But I mean, it is it serves as something you know, like I I'm willing to be a small shadow uh, cast by. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean the you know combination of you know high culture, low culture, low culture, you know pop culture that you know definitely seems like it comes through uh, in the book. Um, so why, why don't we talk? Start off with one. So you're, it's split into various sections, and one of your sections is on Canadian culture. And one of the things I noticed that struck me as interesting about the book is that, um, you know, on the copyright page, um, there's acknowledgement to various, uh, you know, Canadian government art councils, the Ontario Media Development Corporation, uh, Canada Council for the Arts. And I was thinking, like, I don't know if there's really anything in the U.S. that's kind of the equivalent of that. I mean, there's like the National Endowment for the Arts and for the Humanities, but I don't think they or if they do, it's very rare that they actually will sponsor the publication of a book. That, that kind of strikes me as, as the difference between, you know, the Canadian arts and, and American arts. Yeah, no, I, I think it's definitely the case that, I mean, Canada is uh, a small enough country that I think without, you know, some sort of government underwriting, publishing would be much smaller than it is uh, to the extent that, I mean, I, I think it's generally true that before the large scale sponsorship of Canadian writing, most Canadian writers of ambition ended up moving to the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, or to England, uh, and certainly even in the 40s and 50s, someone like Mavis Gallant, you know, moved to France, and Mordecai Richter moved to London. So I, I uh, so yeah, we, I mean, that is a, a difference in Canada, uh, and uh, you know, even though some of that funding has been whittled away over the years, uh, it, it's still the case that uh, that a lot of cultural activity, you know, um, it's not solely funded by the government. Uh, all of these are profit concerns. Mm -hmm. they, they they try to make money, but but there's always like some seedbed of government money uh, that's in there. And yeah, I'm, I'm very uh, pleased by that. I, I think they, it causes problems to some of my libertarian friends. Um, I have a cartoonist friend, Chester Brown, who runs for the Libertarian Party, uh, but his books, like mine, are like underwritten by the government. So, so I think he, he, he has more of a dilemma with this than I do. <laughs> right. So, yeah. I mean, how do you, do you think that shapes, or do you think that marks the difference between, you know, Canadian art, arts culture in terms of content as well, that maybe in America there's more, I mean, if all the publishing houses are trying to make a buck, so maybe there's more. Yeah, that, that, yeah no, that's an interesting thing. And they, there is a kind of critique of, Canadian publishing that uh, and Canadian cultural activity in general that it's not because it's not market oriented. You know, you get things that are more esoteric, specialized. You know, that that, that aren't going for the the big uh, bucks. But I mean, I think um, there is a little bit of truth to that. I mean, I think uh, there's probably less genre publishing going on in Canada mm -hmm. than there is like elsewhere. Like I think that the uh, uh, like all, you know, like yeah, genre writing is a pretty big thing, uh, more so in the United States than in Canada. Oh, even that's changing a little bit. I mean, I think Margaret Atwood, who, who's in my book, um, uh, at least since The uh, Handmaid's Tale, which is her big breakthrough book in the 1980s, mm -hmm. you know, she's been increasingly a genre writer, or she's right. been increasingly part of this trend of being a literary writer who uses genre form. So, right. so yeah, that's, yeah, that's changing. And there's, there's other writers, Stephen Marsh, uh, is a, a, a Canadian, but writes for Esquire. And his most recent novel is about sort of like werewolves who are also uh, a very wealthy American family. <laughs> and so it's a kind of a mix of the kind of, uh, uh, literary fiction and, uh, and horror fiction. Uh -huh. So, so, so yeah, I mean, but I would say, yeah, generically it's true. Like, you know, in Canada, the major Canadian writer of the last century, I would say, the two major Canadian writers of the last century are Mavis Gallant and Margaret and uh, Alice Munro. Mm -hmm. And they're both sort of short story writers. Whereas I don't think a short story writer would have the same prominence in the United States uh, mm -hmm. that I think uh, that, you know, like the major American writers tend to be novelists. They tend to work in a more... You know, even literary novelists like you know Philip Roth and John Updike. Um, so I think that that's uh, yeah, I think that's a, that's a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so that that kind of leads to another question I had. So, um, so I was an English major in college, and I was looking back over my uh, I kept a list of all the books I was assigned in college, and there was only one that was by a Canadian author, and I think maybe you'll appreciate this. It was uh, Bruce McCall's Zany Afternoons. 
Uh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, huh. For a humor class, a humor writing class that yeah. I took. But yeah, yeah. there was nothing else. I think there may yeah, have... Br- 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 Bruce McCall hates Canada. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so that, that, that's even doubly appropriate. You only get one Canadian. And it's somebody who... Uh, uh, I don't know if you've read his autobiography. But, no, I haven't. Uh, he, he's, he was miserable in Canada. And he only became happy when he moved down to the United States. So... Uh, <laughs> He's actually like, uh, uh, I mean, the, uh, the the South Park uh, song, Blame Canada, is actually the model of his life. <laughs> uh, so, 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 yeah, that's, uh, I mean, I, 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 I feel uh, a bit defensive, maybe, about Canada. Like, mm-hmm. just, I mean, I am a Canadian, I have to confess. And, uh, and so things that are Canadian have some interest to me. Uh, I do think we have an interesting literature uh, it's a, it's a, it's a relatively new literature. Like I would definitely say, uh, almost any Canadian book that's written before 1960 is going to be terrible. Like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, mean uh, uh, and I hope you don't have like too many Canadians who are watching blogging ads because they'll be very upset. But if you do go go back to the like, sort of you know so called Canadian classics of uh, Worley Callahan or Hugh Garner or you know like these are just you know, deadly dull books about, you know, life in the prairies or, uh-huh. or things like that. Uh-huh. And, uh, I think, uh, so I mean, why do you think, Canadians, why do you think that is? Well, I mean, I think, and, and again, maybe I'll reveal my socialist bias there, but I do actually think like getting, I mean, I think the interesting writers, uh, all fled the country because they had to like find markets to work in. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, uh, and then the, the Canadian writers that are writing in Canada, uh, yeah, there was just like a much smaller uh, thing. I think there was a colonial attitude often. And so there was like sort of people who were like writing poetry, but they were imitating Woodsworth and Tennyson. So mm-hmm. famously, like there's a Canadian who did a sort of like poem imitating Tennyson, but it's about a hermaphrodite buffalo. Uh, and <laughs> okay. so, 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 so I, I feel like that there's a lot of that sort of stuff. So I'm like trying to, you know, to write Woodsworth, but write it about the ravines of Toronto. Uh-huh. Uh, and so, so yeah, I, th- I think with the 60s, though, for the first time, um, there's like a, a sort of more, more of a nationalist mood, more sponsorship of publishing, and, and more of enough of a critical mass of, uh, writers who emerged, and I think like Alice Munro mm-hmm. uh, is perhaps the first of that. And I think she, along with like a handful of others, like I think there's there's not many of them, but there are a few Canadian writers who I think stand with like you know the best of world literature. Mm-hmm. So I mean, besides Munro and and um, Mavis Gallant and maybe Margaret Atwood, who would you say are you know the quintessential oh. Canadian authors? Yeah, well, I mean the Canadian writers I, I would rank. Highly, and some of them are in my book. Is like uh, uh, Clark Blaze, who I think is like a, a, a kind of like an amazing writer. With uh, uh, and he's both American and Canadian. He was born in Fargo, North Dakota, but of Canadian ancestry. And he has an amazing sense of geography, and I think uh, uh, you know writes wonderfully about you know both Quebec and Florida mm-hmm. and Pittsburgh. And, uh, he's he's an amazing writer. I think Leon Rook, uh, who again is kind of like a bit of a continental writer because he's you know from North Carolina, but. Is a is a kind of like tremendous uh, uh, writer, and I think some of the younger uh, up and coming writers uh, that I have in the book, like Animal Lion, are, are very very interesting, very promising. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, would you say that there? So I mean, you talked about the short story being kind of more of a form that a lot of well known Canadian writers have pursued. Like, is there? I mean, so is there like talk of like a great Canadian novel, or would it be like a great Canadian short story? Yeah, I, I don't think there is much. I mean, I think there's certain writers who have tried to write a great Canadian novel of ambition, like someone like Mordecai Richler, I think, with someone like Solomon Grisky was here. He kind of like tried to write a novel that encompassed the scope of the nation, but that's pretty rare. Like, I think that, the, I, I think that, that is a, a national difference. Like, you have people trying to write the great American novel, but I think in Canada, the goal is to write the perfect Canadian short story, right? <laughs> uh-huh. you, you know, like, they the short, you know, like, write out of, uh, uh, and I, I think the, the outsized influence of um, Margaret, of Alice Munro is a big influence. And like, because she, you know, almost by happenstance is like, you know, the most, uh, uh, the, the most important writer in the country. And then uh, a lot of writers have followed her path and, and written short stories. So there's a kind of, you know, Morovian tradition of the short story. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and, and in general, I mean, I, I mean, I speak with the sort of partisan bias of a Canadian, but I actually prefer short stories to novels because I think 
uh, novels, someone once said like a novel is a long work of prose fiction, which has a serious flaw. And I, I think that's <laughs> generally true. That's like, like, it's hard to have a perfect novel. Because, mm-hmm. Like any long stretch of fiction will have sort of like, you know, like digressions or have uh, uh, parts that uh, sort of uh, uh, are, are just there for narrative purposes, which I think a short story is more like a poem. You can have a kind of perfect short story. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good point. You would, yeah, yeah you wouldn't describe a, a novel as perfect, probably. Uh, that's just that just. Yeah, I think be... it's very rare. I mean, I think I think you do occasionally. I would say sometimes Nabokov wrote things that are pretty close, close to being perfect, right? Like, but I mean, that's pretty rare, right? Like, uh, and he, even like very tremendous novelists, like you know, like Tolstoy or Joyce, like you can look at their novels and think, like you know, like. There are parts of it where you kind of have to force yourself through, right? Like, oh, yeah. I mean, War and Peace yeah. is not perfect. Like, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. And I think it's the nature of the beast or Moby Dick, right? Like, yeah. I think, you know, like all that, like, you know, chapters about, like, whale, uh, uh, pseudo whale science. Right, right. <laughs> so, 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 yeah, I kind of, I think that, uh, uh, and then it's a Canadian in me speaking, but I, I do feel like there's a perfection in the short story uh, that you see. Um, uh, which is really exquisite. Like there's some short stories where like every word is in place mm-hmm. and like, there's like it all, like, you know, like it's, it's a, it's a, uh, a, a beautiful little world that you can kind of, uh, uh, enjoy in, in the way that, you know, some poems are perfect. Yeah. Um, so you, you mentioned Monroe, so she won the Nobel in literature one or two years yeah. ago. And, yeah. and once, and when she won that, I said, oh, well, that means Philip Roth is never going to win. Because they kind of portion these things out in kind of like yes. geographical and language areas, and um, so you're, the first essay in here is about Roth, uh, a really interesting short essay called "Philip Roth as Ghostwriter." Um, do you have any thoughts on whether Roth will win the Nobel? I don't think it's in the cards right now. I mean, it's still possible because now they're giving it to writers very late in life. Like I think uh, Doris Lessing won in her eighties, and, mm-hmm. and there's been a few other cases. But yeah, it seems like he kind of missed the boat, and they might. I mean, they might have thought that like they already kind of gave it to him because they gave it to Saul Bellow, right? Like they might <laughs> think in those terms of like, well, we gave it to an American, you know, Jewish writer, like you know, like uh, that fills the quota or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I certainly think he's like worthy. Uh, you know, like he's he's a better writer than many that have won the Nobel, uh, and he's, he's he's up there with anyone who has. Um, I'm not, but I don't get like excited about it just because I think. Like for me, the purpose of an award is to sell books and to call attention to work, books. And so, like, I already know Philip Roth. I've already read most of his books. So, like, if he wins the Nobel, I'm not gonna like be discovering a new writer. Yeah. Whereas, uh, uh, where, where, yeah, where, whereas, uh, I, I think uh, when it goes to writers that I haven't heard of or I'm less familiar with, that uh, I, I, I feel that that's a better use of the prize. Uh, I mean, we can talk about the, I, I was not, um, I was talking about this once with someone who uh, uh, was involved with the Nobel uh, at a distance. And and uh, he made the interesting point that the best Nobel Prize ever was to Faulkner. Uh-huh. Because Faulkner at that point, he had an audience in Europe, but less so in America. And it really solidified his reputation. Uh, and then, but it also made him a world writer. And then suddenly Faulkner started to, be picked up in Latin America, in Asia. And so, so I think almost now every country has its own Faulkner, right? Like mm-hmm. there's, a, there's a way in which Faulkner became the most important writer of the second half of the 20th century because people like, you know, Gabriel Garcia Marquez were coming out of Faulkner. Yeah. So, uh, so, so that, I mean, you, you can't always be so lucky, but like that's a case where like a writer w- winning the Nobel Prize really changed literary history. Mm-hmm. And his, uh, I don't know if you've read his Nobel acceptance speech. That's maybe the only one that I've, you know, read a couple of times. It's really amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. It's the only one that ever gets quoted. It's the only one. Uh, yeah. So I, I always thought that that was a kind of a, uh, uh, an example of a good, uh, a, a good Nobel Prize choice. I mean, like Philip Roth, it would be, yeah, you'd be nice, you know, but I mean, I feel like he's, he's already, you know, won all the laurels that, Yeah, uh, he could ask for. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and the list of, of authors who never won the Nobel is, you know, as maybe better than the list of authors who did win the Nobel, Tolstoy that's and, right, that's and right. Nabokov. Yeah, no, I mean, he, yeah, yeah. He's, he's better off, yeah, <laughs> being in line with Joyce and Nabokov and, and Boris. And uh, so I think that's, well, the, the, that's the other thing, though. There's a kind of weird paradox to awards where there's always a mismatch, right? Like if you get 
uh, if Nabokov had won the Nobel Prize, it wouldn't be the Nobel Prize is honoring uh, Nabokov. It's like Nabokov is honoring the Nobel Prize, mm-hmm. right? Like because he's he's he's, he's validating the Nobel Prize. Yeah. Uh, and conversely, if someone is uh, like uh, a relatively poor writer uh, and they won the Nobel Prize, then they kind of like they diminish the prize. Yeah. And they're only of interest because they won the Nobel Prize, like Pearl Buck or some some uh, right. Claire Lewis, right? Yeah. Like oh yeah, we kind of, oh yeah that. Not a, it's a kind of middling writer, but they won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so that's what so these prizes are always uh, uh, a, a bit uh, uh, mismatched. I mean, to go back to Alice Munro, like I, uh, I felt a little bit sad about that because uh, I mean, she's certainly worthy of winning the Nobel Prize. I, 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 I wish she had gotten it like about ten years earlier because mm-hmm. uh, she, you know, her health hasn't been that great. She didn't get to travel to Sweden. She, one of her daughters went on her behalf. Her husband of many years had died uh, just a few uh, uh, months before she won the Nobel Prize. Mm-hmm. So I feel like to give it to win it that late in life is like, you know, um, you can't enjoy it as much. As, whereas I think if she had won it 10 years ago, it would have been a, a, a much bigger thing for her. Yeah. yeah. And didn't, did she say that she was retiring from writing? Yeah, she had retired from writing at that point. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. so that's a commonality with Roth, who a couple yeah. years ago announced that he he's not going to be writing fiction anymore. Um, so I, since that's Roth is my favorite author, so I just want to talk a little bit about your short essay, uh, Philip Roth as Ghostwriter. Sure. Uh, yeah, it was really, really interesting. So can you kind of lay out your, your brief argument? Sure, yeah. I mean, so Roth is uh, interesting. There's an interesting paradox in Roth because he's a stone-cold atheist and materialist, right? Like, mm-hmm. there's no sense of, uh, 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 you know, like a divine being in his writing. And like his great rival, say, you know, John Updike, right? Mm-hmm. Who was very much coming out of Christianity. Uh, but, but on the other hand, there's a kind of persistent interest in ghosts in his writing, um, which, which comes up in a, a bunch of different places. I mean, the counter life, um, uh, uh, I mean, there's the, the one of the novels called The Ghost Writer, which doesn't quite have a ghost in it, but there it's in the title. Right. Well, there's and, the kind of the, I, the ghost of, of um, Anne Frank. Yeah, Van Frank, you know, is yeah. ha- haunting that novel, you could say. Yeah, it's, it's very much a presence. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that the interesting ghost, and there's a sort of interesting biographical fact, uh, which his friend Richard Stern uh, had uh, made public, which is that uh, Roth goes to the graveside of one of his. Uh, former lovers and uh, uh, talks to her and he says he gets the advice from her. Uh, so I, I feel like like for Roth, the ghosts uh, are the power of his memory that like the people that he was close to, particularly his parents and then a few other people are very much presences in his life, even when they're not there. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like it's an, it's an, uh, that he is a ghost writer uh, in, in, in the same uh, as much as like Henry James in The Turn of the Screw or uh, Hawthorne in mm-hmm. sort of his, uh, uh, or Stephen King. <laughs> uh, but, but, but I mean, it's very much the ghost of memory. And, and so I, I think that, that that's, uh, uh, so I wanted to suggest that as one way of kind of like looking at his work, which I don't think anyone has discussed before. Yeah, I think I think I hadn't heard that point before, and, and certainly, and you know, a couple in in multiple novels, there's key scenes involving um, at, at graveyards or at um, someone's funeral. Cemeteries, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and every man has one of those, and one of the Zuckerman novels has one, and I think Savas Theater has has a uh, yeah, profane scenes. one. Well, they, <laughs> and, yeah, a very profane one, but but very tender as well. I mean, I think that's one of the interesting things. Like, I mean, in Savas Theater, the main character does something at a graveyard, which. I think most people would consider it to be like a huge desecration, but it's also presented, uh, I think, convincingly as uh, as an act of love. Yeah, yeah. I, th- uh, I think that's actually. I, I actually think Sabbath. I mean, this is an unfashionable choice, but I actually think Sabbath Theater is his best, Roth's best work. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think the esti- its estimation has grown in, in recent years. Um, so why don't we move from Roth to his rival Updike? Uh, you have two essays in here on Updike, one on uh, Updike as a cartoonist. Um, and, you know, since Updike's death a couple of years ago, there's been a biography of him, but I kind of feel like like Updike's, you know, cultural esteem has kind of gone down somewhat as Roth's has kind of gone up. Uh, maybe yeah, because I, I, Roth, I, 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 Roth had this late career resurgence and Optic really didn't. I mean, what do you think about that? I, th- I think that's generally true. That I think like, uh, Roth had a, a very strong string of novels in the 1990s. 
Uh, and then like even towards the end, I think the last few novels aren't as good, but they're still pretty, uh, they're still very, very good. Like, uh, so um, I, I think it's generally true that like, in terms of the work that's most highly valued, Updike is like with the rabbit novels, which really came to an end uh, uh, around 1990. Um, I, think I, I feel like th this will this will change over time like I'm a pretty big on Updike I think that the simply the care that he took with the writing is uh tremendous and I mm -hmm. think like the uh, uh I, I don't think he like hit it out of the park and I think that a lot of his novels are simply good rather than great right like I mm -hmm. think like he was the uh whereas I I I, in some ways, it's maybe the value of specialization. Like Roth really put all his apples into the novel, right? Like he did a few other things, but I mean, it's really, you know, um, and, he, and he put his all into the novels. Whereas like Updike was always like, you know, novelist, short story writer, critic, poet. Right. And and, and so, so yeah, you don't, with, the, uh, with most of Updike's novels, especially the late novels from like, say, the uh, late 1980s onwards, you don't get a sense that he's like putting all his energies into the book mm -hmm. in, in the same way. Whereas I think like with you know, Roth's novels, you, there's a kind of a tremendous intensity with them where you feel like, you know, like he's writing this novel because he has to. And, 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 and once you start reading them, like it's kind of hard to let go. Like he has a kind of tremendous ability to sort of grab the reader and just keep them uh, until the, the last page. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whereas I, 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 up to, I kind of like lack that, I lack that like narrative urgency. Uh, but, yeah, he, but, but, but he was much more like a turner of phrases and, and perfect sentences and descriptions yeah. that were spot on. But yeah, sometimes the plotting was not as not as key or yeah, there wasn't that propulsive force. I, I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the propulsive force, yeah isn't there. But I mean, I, 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 but it's precisely because of those sentences. I do think like Updike will, uh, will, will, will people will return to him. Like, you know, like not, you know, 20 or 30 years from now. Like, I think like the sentences are so good and like so sturdy. Um, I, but, I, but yeah, I mean, I, there's all sorts of other extra cultural reasons why uh, or cultural reasons why he's not uh, 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 so fashionable. I mean, there's a lot of gender stuff mm -hmm. that's very problematic. But, but yeah, I, I do tend to think that the, uh, I feel like style is a preservative. <laughs> if you have a good like style, like your 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 work will stay fresh yeah. over time, and then people will return to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you do you have a favorite update novel? I think the I would say the Centaur, uh, which is a novel about his father. And that, that, kind of, that's mine as well. That's funny. That's it, oh yeah. <laughs> it, I think yeah. it's his first. Was it his first written, but not first published? Something like that. It's one is very very first or second. You no, know, it, it's very early. Yeah, it's it's actually I think is third novel but i think it's the first yeah 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 but i mean it's 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 very early uh i, I think he actually originally attended rabbit run and the centaur to go together he wanted to have like a, you know rabbit and horse <laughs> but, but they <laughs> they spun off into two different novels yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. but but no i think that's a it's a very moving uh book and i think that his his kind of like love of his father uh and his and the the, the plight of his father being you know, like this kind of, you know, high school teacher that's kind of beset by the world and kind of, you know, mocked and uh, and, and has all these troubles. It's, it's very movingly told. And, and then also, I, th I feel like there's something where up to, like, his style works well when writing about, like, someone who's young. It's, it's written from the, partially from the point of view of, like, the, the, the son. Uh, and, and so there's a kind of, like, freshness of perception where you really do feel the update style works perfectly with that, where you feel like, you know, it is the, the teenager coming to an awareness of the world and, and having all the sort of senses alive the way they are when you're a teen. Yeah. So, so for me, I would, so we both recommend the centaur. Everyone should go out and read it, but for people who haven't yeah. read it, it kind of mixes a weird, you know, mythological reality with everyday reality. And that, that's in their contrast with Roth, I guess, because like you said, Roth is very uh, material. I don't think there's any supernatural, occurrences in his novels that I can think of, although some I've kind of played with chronology and, and alternate like alternate timelines and stuff. But like up, you know, Updike had the centaur, he had the witches of Eastwick. Uh yes. you know, he was more fantastical writer than than Roth. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. No, that's I mean yeah, it's partially maybe going out of his religious concerns. And then also uh, I mean I think Updike was more open towards uh uh, uh, uh 
like being influenced by people like uh, Boraz, who are more fantastical. And I think uh, so. Yeah, I, I, I feel. Uh, but yeah, but I mean beyond that. Um, I mean, I guess there is a similarity in the two that they both are very true to their experience and very true to memory. And the the attempt to, you know, for Updike to bring back that world of Shillington, uh, Pennsylvania, and for Roth to bring back, you know, Newark, New Jersey of his youth, like that, that seems like very, that's a commonality between them. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Um, so, so uh, like I said, one of your essays is, is called um, Updike as Cartoonist or something along those lines. Um, yes, 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 yeah. Uh, I'm like portrait of the artist as a young fan, um, and you uh, go through. So uh, Updike, like his original dream when he was at the Harvard Lampoon, was to be a, a New Yorker cartoonist. Yeah, yeah, is, but even before that, when he was like a uh, high school student, uh, he wanted to be. Uh, he was already sending off cartoons to the New Yorker, and he was. So that was his initial goal in life: was to be a cartoonist, uh, maybe become an animator, like you know, if working for the Disney Studio. Uh, and then he, uh, at the Harvard Lapoon, he kind of discovered his facility with words was perhaps greater or uh, uh, something he could do more with than with uh, drawing. So he became a, a writer. But I think that there's a, way, a sense in which his the visualness uh, always stayed with him. So I, I think in, the, in that essay, I'm trying to like show that uh, the cartooning was not a, you know, like just uh, something he gave up when he was a kid. Like it kind of remained with him. And then maybe tracing through the influence of cartooning in his work. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting essay. Uh, using you know going back and finding these these letters that he wrote to his favorite uh, cartoonists, in which he kind of insinuates himself <laughs> in saying, yeah, you know, he, tells each different one that you know he's there. Yeah, no, no, the yeah, I should, I should, yeah, I should mention those are letters. I I think the letter to those are letters I actually found. Uh, although I now I discovered that someone had found the uh, Little Orphan Annie letter before I did, but he wrote letters to the creators of Little Orphan Annie and the, the creator of uh, Steve Canyon, Milton Kniff. Uh, and uh, I was actually working in the archives of Little Orphan, uh, the cartoonist who did Little Orphan Annie, Harold Gray, and I was reading through a, a lot of the fan mail, which was very interesting. And then I, I came across this letter and I was reading it and I was like, wow, this is a really beautiful letter. And then I looked at the bottom and it said, you know, like John Updike. And <laughs> I, I, I did a search and yeah, I was like, sure. And I wrote Updike. I sent him a copy of the letter. Uh, and uh, and then later I was working with, in the uh, papers of Milton Kniff, uh, who did Terry and the Pirates and Steve Canyon and found another Updike letter. So, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, 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 I mean, that essay is partially an outgrowth of that archival research where, like, uh, uh, I thought I'd, I'd uh, and, and try to, like, yeah, make sense of, uh, 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 what uh, uh, what Updike gained from that uh, from from, from uh, well, 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 um, the fact that his fanhood, his young love of cartooning, was something that uh, stayed with him. Mm -hmm. um, so why don't we talk about cartooning a little bit more? You have a section, the final section of the book is about comics, and you you're a scholar who's done a lot of work on the history of comics, and yeah. you've worked uh, with contemporary cartoonists like Seth and Chris Ware. Uh, so, I mean, what, what's the origin of your interest in, in comics and cartooning? Well, I think a lot of it has to go back to being an immigrant, actually. I was uh, born in India. Uh, I came over when I was five, so I, I was learning English a bit late. My father had bought uh, some of these. Uh, there's, in India, they have a, a line of sort of like classics, illustrated comics that illustrate Indian history and classic works of Indian literature. Mm -hmm. And uh, and because it's India, they're in multiple languages. So they're available in Punjabi, Hindi, and English. Uh, and so I had, uh, those were among the first books I read in English. And so they were kind of a bridge between uh, India and North America. Mm -hmm. And so so and I think a lot, like a lot of immigrants, like uh, including Francois Mouly, who I sort of uh, write about uh, in, in the book, uh, in, uh, comics were kind of like a, a useful... Uh, bridge uh, between cultures. So, so that and, and so, so when I first started learning English, I was reading like you know things like Peanuts, and and later I, I read uh, sort of superhero comic books. And as it happened, my teenage years uh, occurred at the same time where there's a kind of uh, maturing of comics uh, with people like Art Spiegelman starting to do Mouse, with Hernandez brothers doing Love and Rockets, and so I, I was very interested in that and. Uh, and uh, and and yeah, so I continue to write about that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a bit interesting because uh, I feel like uh, it's like something that 
has been with me for so long and there's stuff that I used to think was obscure, but now has had like sort of like a global impact. So it feels like I went to like high school with Napoleon, right? <laughs> and, then, and so suddenly like, oh yeah, old Louis, uh, he, he's, he's going to launch an attack on Moscow, you know? It's like, so, so like when I was growing up, you know, I was, um, well, I remember the last superhero comics I was sort of inter- interested in before I moved on to like Spiegelman was like things like uh, Frank Miller's Daredevil and uh, the X-Men with mm-hmm. uh, Claremont, uh, Days of Future Past. And then and, and, and those held my interest. And then and then I sort of gave up on the superhero comics. But then like, you know, like flash forward 30 years and suddenly like the uh, uh, the storylines that I had read are you know, dominating the cinema. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was I was a comic book fan when I was a kid, and it, uh, you know, it, this was in in the '90s, and it definitely was. You know, comic books were not popular then. Yeah. And it was not like a cool thing to read or to know. You know, to be paging through back issues or anything. And then, you know, as I kind of right around the time I aged out of it, you know, all these movies started coming out, and now, you know, there's six different comic book movies, <laughs> uh, blockbuster movies every year, and like yeah. everyone is just. Uh, you know, the, the the smart thinking is like we're all so sick of these superhero movies every, you know, taking up all the oxygen uh, every year. But it, it is kind of bizarre how this thing that was a total geek, like niche yeah. culture thing has has totally taken over the entertainment industry. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And, and even beyond that, I mean, like because I was interested in Spiegel and Bully, I knew about like the French tradition and things like Charlie Hebdo. And then suddenly like it's become a flashpoint in, you know, like the global cultural clash. Right. Like. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's it, yeah, it is a kind of uh, uh, but 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 I mean that's something it's it's an interesting thing that when that happens like uh, I mean the other example which is non comics related is when I was at university I studied under uh, some uh, Straussians people who had studied under Leo Strauss, uh, Clifford Orwin and Thomas Pango and so I had an interest in Strauss's uh, thinking and in the Straussians. And at the time, like this was the late 80s, early 90s, that was a pretty obscure thing to be interested in. Like they were kind uh-huh. of, you know, this marginal academic cult. And, you know, like, you know, flash forward 10 years and suddenly like, Paul Wolfowitz is whispering in the ears of George W. Bush. And you have like these Straussians in the Pentagon who are like, you know, uh, le- leading the charge saying they're weapons of mass destruction in, in Iraq. And suddenly like my, <laughs> my, my academic, my, you know, obscure academic interest has real world resonance. Yeah, well, I feel like that's an essay waiting to be written, comparing the obscure, you know, comic books from obscurity to triumph and, you know, Straussians from obscurity to triumph and disaster in the Iraq War. Um, yeah, yeah, and you yeah. Know, one, of the, one of your sections in the book is about right-wing politics. I mean, why did you why do you focus on right-wing politics in particular as opposed to politics in general? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was sort of gathering my essays together, and I, there did seem to be a cluster of things about the right. Uh, I mean, I feel like we've been living, it's changing a little bit, now, right right now. But I mean, from the 1980s till, you know, about a, a few years ago, we were living in a very conservative era. And mm-hmm. I think uh, even though my politics are like social democratic, like I have had to be aware of the right. And so I have an intellectual interest. And I actually, I mean, to be honest, I was actually more conservative when I was younger. I had, My first votes were for Brian Mulroney and for uh, Kim Campbell. Uh, conservative. I think you'll have to explain those references for our American viewers because yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't Brian, recognize those names. <laughs> Brian Mulroney was a Canadian Conservative Prime Minister in the 1980s, and Kim Campbell was also Prime Minister, but for a very short period uh, for the Conservative Party as well. She was Canada's first female Prime Minister. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, it's a bit, the Canadian context is a bit di- different because, I mean, Brian Mulroney, you know, uh, I mean, he, uh, unlike Thatcher and Reagan, he was. Uh, you know, opposed to apartheid in South Africa, and you know, led the Commonwealth to have sanctions against apartheid, and, and so and and Mulroney once said his favorite American politician was Mario Cuomo. So, <laughs> <laughs> which I mean, it's I mean, yeah, because you consider that Mulroney is the head of the Conservative Party in Canada. That's okay. uh-huh. uh, so, but 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 yeah, I, I did have a kind of conservative phase, um, and yeah, I, I I think it's an interesting challenge to write about people. Those politics you don't agree with, and try to be, you know, to try to do them some justice while also disagreeing with them. And, mm-hmm. But I'll leave readers yeah. to decide whether I, I I manage to do that or not. Yeah, and you, I mean, so I, you have an interesting short essay in here about Rob Ford that I think placed him in the you know cultural context that made his 
the scent more make more sense and it was kind of inexplicable inexplicable to a lot of americans um and i just also want to mention the essay you published recently in the new republic about dinesh d'souza which i thought was was really interesting and uh kind of went into his intellectual history in a in a fascinating way oh yeah um, yeah yeah thank you yeah yeah yeah. and in both cases i mean when i try to write about the right like i want to not, not set aside my own politics because i want to make my point of view very clear but i want to try to like have a, some level of empathy or some level of trying to understand, you know, where does this stuff come from? Yeah. And anyway, with the case of Rob Ford, like I grew up in Rexdale in Toronto, which is the uh, the suburb of Toronto where Rob Ford also came from. So I, I sort of have, it's entirely possible that I smoked hash that Rob Ford <laughs> sold in the 1980s. <laughs> <laughs> That's a claim to fame, uh, for sure. Claim, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so a little bit more about about comics. I mean, so comics is really kind of like I, reading the whole collection. It's kind of like the through line. Like you know, you know, up next cartooning uh, Guy Davenport as a cartoonist. Yeah, and it's almost I, like I a didn't talk about it, but Margaret Atwood is also a cartoonist. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, she's done a whole bunch of yeah, for some sort of Canadian literary magazine called The Brick. She did. She's been doing cartoons for like thirty years, so they, they haven't been collected. But she's uh, she's a cartoonist. <laughs> I mean, so what do you think is the connection like? you know between is like cartooning something that auth- sometimes authors will will set aside and in, in, in kind of like updike did or sometimes it, it, it can complement the work i mean what do you what do you see as like the connection between you know literature and, and, and cartoons yeah i mean i think it's a very interesting uh, uh question it is something that does run through the collection i i feel like the visual um people we see before we can read, right? Like, like you know, we we see the world around us, and we draw before we can uh, uh, write. Uh, and so there's a um, lit- and and letters themselves are from a picto writing, right? Like the earliest mm-hmm. or- or origins of letters are, as far as we can make out, like sort of pictograms that became abstract, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I feel that there's uh, uh, part of the attraction of cartooning is that it returns us to the earliest stages of our you know, creativity to, you know, like to being the child making a mark on paper, right? Which I think is one of the earliest creative acts that, you know, aside from, along with singing, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, uh, so um, uh, for me, that explains a lot of this sort of like the power of cartooning, that it's so primordial and also why people, even people who take up writing like Atwood and Davenport, uh, and I could mention Nabokov, who's, who's not in the collection, but is very much in this tradition. Like they, they, they kind of keep returning to that visual mode, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So, so I, I, I think that that's part of it. So, I think part of the interest and power of cartooning is the return to the sort of primordial creativity, which is also the source, the continued source of creativity in, in adulthood. Mm-hmm. Um, so another question I had about <coughs> cartooning. So I, I, I marked out this line that you had in one, one of the essays which was uh, historically comics have been among the most misogynist of all art forms. I mean, why do you think there are so few you know, women cartoonists or comic book artists? Yeah, I, I think there's a uh, bunch of social reasons for that. Well, one is that like just where cartooning appeared in, like it first started in the sort of newspaper world. Mm-hmm. And there were sort of female cartoonists very early on, uh, but they were, but it, they existed in the context of, the same sort of, you know, like this kind of like very manly, you know, front, you know, the front, sort of front page world. Uh, and so, so if you were a female cartoonist, you had to be as tough as the, as the guys, just as in uh, in the movie, the front page, the female reporter has to be. And, and so, so there were kind of, and even uh, the National Cartooning Association, which was formed by Milton Kniff and Al Cap in the 40s, like when they were first formed, they had a huge debate, should we allow female members? And it was because and they did, and there was a whole, uh, and they, they eventually did, but there was like a whole bunch of people saying, well, no, we're cartoonists, you know, we like to spit uh, and scratch our balls and, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like we want to have a club where we can be men, you know? Uh-huh. Uh, and and th- then with the, um, uh, I mean, to, to go back to the, uh, and that carried over to the sort of like the uh, uh, comic book world. I think with the sort of triumph for the superhero in the 60s, the most successful genre within the comic book world happened to be the most female unfriendly. That, uh, mm-hmm. uh, and then the, the, that's a little bit of a happenstance. I think like in the 50s, the, the uh, 40s and 50s, you had a lot of female friendly genres like romance comics. But the romance comics really suffered from the censorship 
of the comics code where like before they would have stories that we you know like like are uh dealt with a broad range of romantic situations after the comics code they have to be much more anodyne and sort of romance comics die down mm-hmm. so, so so i think that these are all kind of like they're maybe the historical factors but i feel like that's also really changed like in the last 10 or 15 years you've had uh you know like a uh, a tremendous number of cartoonists and like right now I would say among the sort of art cartoonists certainly like you know Linda Berry or Marjorie Satrapi or Alison Bechdel are you know like among the leaders in the form and there's yeah. probably like as many female cartoonists in the alternative comics I actually mentioned the underground comics in the 60s uh, had their own misogyny which was due I think to the sort of like countercultural sort of anti-establishment norms where you know like you kind of had uh, respectability was seen as female, and so you had like your know, cartoons like Robert Crumb and S. Clay Wilson do kind of like very violent, gross, misogynist imagery. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah I feel I think I, I read once that uh, Walt Disney had an explicit policy that they wouldn't hire female animators. Yeah, that's um, right. That, that's right. Yeah, I think I I, see, I did a little Twitter essay on that, but yeah, that's exactly right. That that Disney himself uh, and he actually hired more female cartoonists than most other places but I mean he and he had the kind of whole bunch of sexist rationals and well you train them and then they go get married and, and he also said they don't have a sense of humor you know and so so uh-huh. I think that's it but I think yeah, it's more like there's kind of like a boys club atmosphere that has existed in comics so right yeah. I mean yeah. this is the weird thing about it to me is like you can kind of understand why like in like a, sp- a bunch of sports writers like wouldn't want to let like yeah. women you know, enter their profession or something like that kind of makes sense. But like, you know, uh, but, like, but, 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 cartooning was... is not like super, super like manly, <coughs> yeah. you know, manly thing to do. Well, you wouldn't think so, but I think a lot of the newspaper uh, cartoonists were coming out of sports writing. And that's another factor that they had a lot of the early car- newspaper cartoonists, they did sports cartooning as well. People like Tad Dorgan and whatnot, like mm-hmm. they, would, they would be sent to like fights and they'd be sent to baseball games and they would draw those. And so okay, so like before just, photography became common in newspapers, like there'd be an illustration of you yeah. know, a boxing match or something. Yeah, and that's that right. kind of... yeah, yeah. George Harriman covered the big boxing match between Jack Johnson and uh, uh, so 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 all, all those. Uh, so so that sporting culture was very much tied to newspaper cartooning. Yeah. So 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 in a lot of ways, like the, the big newspaper cartoonists of the you know twenties, thirties, and forties would be hanging out with sports writers, and they would have the same locker room mentality. Mm-hmm. Okay, why don't why don't we maybe close with your the last essay in here about that you mentioned about about Seth and imaginary libraries and it just I really like this one um, I don't I don't know Seth very well but you talked about you know this idea of the the imaginary library in literature in general and in uh, work that Seth has done in particular yeah yeah well yeah Seth is a Canadian cartoonist and he's done a uh, bunch and, uh, uh, and he's also a book designer uh, and uh, yeah he his in his some of his uh, recent works. He's kind of created these imaginary libraries and these like sort of comics within comics that are made up comics. And I mm-hmm. tried to link that up with this kind of very interesting tradition that goes back, you know, at least as far as Rabelais of like, you know, works of fiction that have uh, fiction within them, right? And have mm-hmm. sort of, uh, and so it's like Rabelais is a, is a big kind of uh, figure, more recently Borez. Uh, and it's an interesting I think it's a commentary on creativity because I think you become a writer because you feel that there's some books that are missing. Like even though our libraries are filled with books, there's some book that hasn't been written yet and you mm-hmm. feel like it's your obligation to write it. So in some ways, every writer is trying to, you know, create a, an imaginary book for, for the library, uh, you know, has an imaginary book that they want to place in the library. And so mm-hmm. I, I think Seth is in the tradition uh, 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 of Borez and also Stanislaw Lamb, who did that very interesting book, which is uh, an entire book of book reviews, but all the books are like non existent books. So he's <laughs> reviewing fictional books. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm reminded of um, uh, Infinite Jest, and yes. there's, the, there's an imaginary um, uh, film, you know, the film biography of the father f- figure uh, who creates the title work in, in this complex novel, but there's a, a list of like his 25 films and short films and it yeah. gives like the the titles and short you know kind of silly descriptions of the movies and one of them was called the uh, history i always remember was called um tennis everyone instead of <laughs> ten, tennis anyone uh, <laughs> like a short film about tennis uh yeah so it's, it's you know a great author can come up with these these imaginary you yeah. know imaginary yeah. works and, and sometimes you just wish you could you could read these uh, or see these works that don't well, don't even well, exist and sometimes i mean there's a huge power to that like i think 
uh, Conan Doyle once referred to like you know the tale of the giant rat of Sumtra, which the what was whatever that the world yeah, yeah. was not ready for, and like you know, and that's all there is, like just like this reference to uh, uh, a case that uh, uh, the world isn't ready to read, and that's so powerful. Like that's you know, like you think about that story more than like some of the actual Sherlock Holmes stories, <laughs> because you're thinking like, uh, how do well, what did Sherlock Holmes do with this giant rat? You know? and, uh, yeah, and, and no no story that anyone would write that would. Prefer- to be the tale of the giant rat of Sumatra would ever be as good as you know the one in your mind just exactly, from that exactly. title exactly exactly and uh, people have to actually foolishly tried to write that story and, <laughs> and, and it, it's absurd it's just like the suggestion is as powerful is more powerful than the actuality yeah yeah, yeah. okay well I think we're about at the end of our time I'm holding the book up to the camera again sweet lecture okay. uh, I see that, I, yeah. If you're interested in uh, Canadian literature, Canadian culture, uh, culture in general, uh, comics, uh, you have a short, short section on science fiction, right wing politics. Um, I, I recommend you pick it up. I also recommend anyone who's on Twitter uh, who is not following you on Twitter should definitely remedy that as quickly as possible because you, you're the pioneer of the Twitter essay. Uh, uh, yeah, do you want to talk, I, I, just I talk very briefly about the Twitter essay? Huh? Well, do you want to just talk very briefly about the Twitter essay? Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say. I, mean, I think other people have been doing Twitter essays. I think I maybe helped popularize the form just because I do it so often. I, so it's like basically taking uh, <coughs> an idea uh, and and uh, numbering them and doing it like you know like in point form. Um, I, I think for me the advantage of Twitter essays is it's a classic essay in the sense that it's not definitive. It's like you're 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 putting forth an idea and trying to see if it works. And then you're also getting reaction. And I often find the reaction for me justifies the Twitter essay. Like you get like people responding to it and, and suggesting new ideas. Um, mm-hmm. I might actually do a book of Twitter essays. I've been talking to a poacher about that. <laughs> like just like, cause I think it's interesting enough to see, it will be interesting to see if like the, the form can survive being in print. You know? Yeah, that is interesting. I'm sure there's been <coughs> books that are uh, been written that are kind of like based on parody Twitter accounts or, you know, yeah. m- maybe, but this would be maybe the first real intellectual <laughs> bu- book uh, based, yeah, on, yeah. based on Twitter. So I, I hope I hope that comes together. <laughs> okay, thank you. And th- thank you for having me on. It's, it's, been, a, it's, a, it's a great interview and I, I, I'm, I'm glad you like the book. It's, it's uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I feel like it, it gives a sort of cross section of my mind. So it's always interesting <laughs> to see how people react to it. Well, thanks so much for coming on, and uh, maybe we'll have you uh, back again sometime soon. And thanks to all of our viewers, uh, and tune in next time. Yes, thank you.